So how can we feel optimistic in the world of artificial general intelligence? That is the question for today. So let me set a challenge for us all, and we won't go too far back, but to the end of uh, 2022, OpenAI broke ground or broke silence with GPT. And it was the first time that we could look at kind of machine learning and understand that machines could understand human context. And this had profound consequences, so much that it got the industry rallying, tons of investment. The large players started to break ground as well with their own chatbots. But there was something profound about it, and I started to think about it for a long time. Here's someone in the field for 20 years and was doing deep learning, and at the same time thought, oh my God, now, what's the progress going to look like as a result of this now knee-jerk reaction to the first player breaking ground? What would it mean? What progress could we expect? How fast would it happen? Uh, would there be a replacement effect? I heard that, that earlier. Could it replace humanity, possibly? And then I, I thought, well, actually, what, what's an interesting way to look at that is relevance. You know, what, what can we say about humans that have held us you know, you know, in front or given us an advantage over the years? And we're going to explore the fact that history is repeating itself, even though it's about to speed up a, a lot, lot more. Um, the Great Replacement. So having thought about this, it would be remiss of me not to just mention a few concepts. When we see lots and lots of technological change and when we apply scale to it, we start to think of the large ramifications and that instead of the computer side or the algorithmic side of our brain, we normally go to protection and feelings. So we become defensive about this idea of, well, we're going to lose our jobs. Um, you know, ultimately, who is going to be the producer of meaning? Who's going to govern us? Um, you know, is this the end of humanity? Well, I humbly think that that's, that's not the case. In fact, I think there's an incredible opportunity to look at the replacement effect and say that actually uh, history is going to show us that it hasn't actually replaced jobs, that nothing's replaced humanity. And actually, we're very much in a pole position. But so then, what is the, what is the challenge for us? And that's that it's how we partner with AI systems how we all recognize that we've probably got a, a, a bigger role than we think today in working with this sped up information craze that we're going to go through. And that partnership and placing ourselves at the right point is the simple message behind this presentation. And we'll get to that next. So some reasons for optimism. Uh, I think as I look at a lot of the conversations around AI, I think there are now, we're starting to get out of that kind of worried, concerned, defensive phase to more optimistic presentations. But we get a lot of this, I wouldn't call them conspiracy. I, I, I consider them a polar kind of conversations around the extremes of what could happen. But if we were to go back, and I'll, I'll take you back to the 90s, I was actually part of this movement. I'm turning 53, and I was big into automation, where software was you know, automating us out of a job. It was taking data, it was speeding up roles. And people said, oh my goodness, we're going to lose our job here. What, what are we going to do? But at a macro level, it was clear that if you look, certainly in the Western world, where there is a similar economic system that we could recognize, there was no effect on unemployment whatsoever. In fact, humans went and repurposed themselves and had wonderful careers after the automation phase. In fact, automation didn't affect every industry but it did have a significant effect and is a worthy replacement example. Let me take you to the early 2000s. So, you know, we, get, we got the, the World Wide Web, we got search, and then we got e-commerce. And the way to think about it is we, we got access to this vast pool of information. Everything was going online. And then Google and others came along and they organized it for us so that we could search it. And then we started to transact on that information, products and services through e-commerce. There was another replacement effect here. Everything's going online. What will we do about education? What will we do about brick and mortar structures? Um, you know, our shop's going to disappear on Main Street or High Street. We're, you know, depending, we're here, high, high Street, I guess. And what are we going to do about this idea of, of, of living in this new world that's online or, or in the cloud? But actually what we found was that the High Street found its purpose still, and it's been much more of a slow, gradual process indeed uh, certain things, vinyl records, books, you know, we've found other ways to, to distribute them and acquire them. 
But equally, we've found other reasons to have physical premises. So that gradual process did not create a replacement effect. So if we sum that up, if humanity 1.0 was this kind of age of information abundance, if you think about the web, we never, I'm old enough to remember the A to Z and yellow pages and all these other things that were out there, we could not fathom that we could have all that information and still be relevant. But if, if that's where we're coming from, we're certainly at the age of information meaning. And that's because now machines can understand human context. And this is profound because in, in, in an extended conversation, we would see now robots coming onto the classrooms, into care homes, uh, you know, uh, uh, on the streets. If we look at workflow automation that's been around for, for 60 years, and now we add AI agents, which I'm going to come on to, which is essentially a program that's going to run a bunch of tasks for us and, uh, and answer questions that we raise. We're going to get to a point where the life is going to speed up and enrich our lives, and we have to question where we want to be. So quick sum up of what we're up against, and I'm going to sprint through this, and I think you've got some context of it today. Artificial general intelligence is a rather loose uh, set of definitions espoused by different parts of the world. So for, for the sake of clarity, I'll give a, a very quick definition. If we, th if we consider this as a, uh, as a benchmark, a place to start, the artificial general intelligence is when machines can equivocally or outpace human thought. They can reason and think like humans. So with that definition, I'd like to leap forward and just quickly say, well, where will we start to see the very first form of general intelligence? We might say that's the pause for opportunity and rightfully concern. And this is where a lot of the conversations actually start. And it's because it's an, it's an accepted view, I think, that what we see today is the very, very, very beginning of public AI and its limitations, chatbot limitations. And it, you're noticing Every week we're reading another announcement, another large language model, another blah, 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 that's creating something in the world of AI. So general intelligence allows us to espouse a, a, a wider theory. So people use it as a beginning point uh, or a stepping off point uh, to the next part of the world. So domain-based AGIs is essentially a specialty field where whether it's an industry, a sub-industry or an interested group, it is essentially a highly focused database or dynamic database, let's call it a large language model, that will, that will undertake very specific tasks to conquer particular questions within its field of specialty. This is profound because today we have these very, very wide large language models. GPT would be an, an example. And there are a number of, of others out there with Google and Perplexity and some of these others that, that are out there. Anthropic, uh, Microsoft, etc. This is important because now what we can do is we can target communities within a field of specialism that are contributing to this large language model. And we can start to compact that, that centric nature of what we call providing guardrails or business rules. So we can think much harder and reason longer at coming up with some of these solutions. Now tag on a program, think of it as a curator. Indeed, it's just a script, a UI, and a set of workflows that we call an AI agent. And they are tasked with answering our questions and automating or carrying out tasks and doing that without our knowledge. They may do that in the background. And here is perhaps the most profound opportunity that we've ever seen. So in the field of medicine, there'll be vertical LLMs and AI agents, and then there'll be you know, the same in the automotive sector, the same in financial services, and the list goes on. Indeed, vertical LLMs and AI agents are now spawning in the tens of thousands, soon hundreds of thousands, and indeed, quite possibly millions in these verticals, industries, sub-industries, or interested groups or parties. So we're going to have a profound opportunity to get to this kind of you know, generalized in intelligence. So... The importance of this is a few things. One is we're going through the fastest technological change we've ever, ever seen. And by the way, this is not a technical presentation. 
this is a presentation that affects everyone, including my mother. How do you now look at this, this world and say, well, if it keeps speeding up, where, where does it end? We're going to get to a point of ubiquity where speed is no longer a meaningful measurement. It's not important. It's actually far more about placement. It's where the human endeavor takes us and how we want to partner with AI. Let me use uh, an example quickly, if, if you can indulge me. In the world of human productivity, an area that I'm, I'm focused a lot on recently, if you take your daily smart tools, we all have smartphones, I'm, I'm sure, and we think of a calendar, um, your notes or journaling tool, SMS, email, tasks, projects. These tools are kind of static tools until we give it an input. It doesn't really process anything. But now imagine that an AI system can take that community, that vast information pool, and analyze your life and come up with productivity solutions and make you increasingly digitally aware. The profound consequences of that is that AI can think fast, it can see around corners, it can understand what the collective, what we think, and design solutions for you. So an example would be, your alarm is brought forward half an hour in the morning. You wake up and you feel it's a little early and you realize that AI has reset your alarm, woke you up because it understands that on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, you go to work. And on Monday and Friday, you work at home. It's your day to go to work and it realizes there's traffic en route. So it wakes you up early, it tells you there's traffic en route and it arranges your new transportation and prepares you for work. We're just human. This is, this is one limitation that we can't plan 24 hours, just like business doesn't sleep, AI doesn't sleep while the system is on. So this idea that we can build vertical LLMs with an agent on top there to serve our, our, our interests and, and, and drive us forward is going to create instant productivity opportunities. We're about, as a world, to become not just more digitally aware, but incredibly productive as a result of this contextual change. I make the claim, I think more people are coming around to it, but I, I really think it's here. I see it from, from the world I'm in, and I see it from my kind of natural learnings as I'm a curious, curious person. The AGI is actually here at a domain-based level. Domain-based AGI is here, and actually it can already outpace human thought. Except for the comedy, it's not it's not a doom and gloom conversation. And actually, I don't think it's the end of the human race, far, far from it. And it is about optimism. It can outpace human thought. So what is the point? And there's a key message in this slide and for this presentation. And it's a simple one. And it's where we place ourselves in the process. So if we think about this model, there is all these communities spawning, large and small vertical LLMs, all, all over humanity, tackling you know, work and, and, and life uh, challenges and, and planetary cha challenges like, let's say, the climate. While all this is happening, all these agents are coming up with ideas and, and solutions. As that information is under, it, it, as an AI agent undertakes the task and gives you an answer, it's our job to receive that information and work with the AI agent and be placed in front of it to set the next requirements for that AI agent. And that continual partnership has some very similar um, characteristics to other transformational change that we've seen before, back in the automation era, back in the cloud era of the early 2000s. It is gonna be about us being able to position ourselves so that we are looking in at this information, this vast sped up world that we live in that's also gonna become, again, vastly automated. And say, well, okay, this is wonderful. We've got all this information. How do we now pass that next set of requirements? And that's what's gonna be important. I can tell you, life will be fast, much faster than it is today. And I'm adamant that um, it will feel more automated, but I think it can be extremely fulfilling. And we are as relevant as always. And so if you're a doctor, I'll hit some of you here for sure, but a practitioner, an entrepreneur, you know, a researcher, an educator, you know, a manufacturer, it doesn't matter, a student. We're all relevant because we have skills and we have experiences. 
and that's what humanity is made out of. And actually, if you think about what AI is looking at, it's looking at the sum collective of human knowledge. And what's interesting about that is that wherever we are, there's going to be potentially millions of vertical LLMs and AI agents. And all of our skills are likely to find many, many of these pools of, of, of information and these agents where you can place yourself using that information and evolving that information and being part of that progress. And I happen to think that that's an absolute certainty for those that want, want to do that. There'll be small and large systems, as I mentioned, for everyone. Don't worry, that's in abundance. The one thing we know is there'll be enough computational power, there'll be enough databases, or what we might call large language models, and AI agents are gonna start writing themselves. We're not gonna worry about the, the task maker or the person that answers our question. And there's an important point here, and it's a real simple one, that uh, AI systems aren't sentient. They can't feel like us. They can't deal with grey judgment. And a single AI system is actually going to spend less life, less time on this planet than most humans. So we have a, a huge role to play in the aftermath of AI. So how can we be part of this journey? And this is perhaps one of the most important points because I know that my, my, my mother probably will not um, care too much, but actually we all have to jump on the train and not a stopping train because it's a competitive world and it's speeding up. We all want to get on that train. We want to lean forward, lean in, and actually analyze the information and put yourself in front of that AI agent in your part of the world and help guide the next set of requirement, requirements. Some of the greatest achievements, curing cancer, extending life expectancy, food, water, prosperity, it's all there to be had in this next wave. That's what I call humanity 2.0. Thank you.